Why hello there, how you doing, how you feeling? Welcome back to The Random Show with I, your host, Agostino Zinga. Nice, actually. <laughs> Welcome back to the Agostino Zinga Show. What's going on? What's happening, people? Hope you're well, hope you're good, wherever you may be. This is the Agostino Zinga Show, the number one cultural commentary podcast in the world. The number one cultural commentary podcast in the world coming at you live and direct from an undisclosed location somewhere in the depths of London. I'm sweating. I'm perspirating. I'm feeling like a big, greasy gorilla. And I hope you are too. I hope you are too. Jay Slater, search for missing Brit, focuses on the village. Curse of the BBC. The search for a British teenager who went missing after a night out in Tenerife has entered into its fifth day, with the rescue teams and police focusing on the rural village and a valley below it. Despite extensive searches throughout involving drones, dogs, helicopters, no trace of Jay Slater has been found. The 19-year-old from Otswold Thistle in Lancashire was last heard from when he called a friend shortly before 9am in the morning on Monday. His last known location was on a path in a mountainous terrain of a rural Del Tell, rural Deteno National Park on the northwest of the island. And you got a nice, big, happy, glowy picture of Jay Slater there himself. The text continues. Mr. Slater's friends and family said he got into a car with two men he met while on holiday and left the group he travelled with in the tourist hotspot of Playa de la Americas in the southern Tenerife. The search teams appear to be methodically searching along the mountain road and are focused on a ravine before moving to a valley in the village of Masca. Dog teams have been sent uh, much of the day working the area and near the farm buildings. Police mounting and the rescue officials have been seen examining the steep areas. They carefully combed through dead palm trees covering the river at the bottom of the hillside. Investigators have been taking away bags of rubbish from the area to try and find clues. And the apartment owner said that a reporter she saw Mr. Slater walk up the road past her property but did not see him again after that, describing the situation as worrying. The apprentice bricklayer was on his first holiday without his parents and was attending an NRG festival with two friends. Lucy Law, who was the last person to speak to him, said he told her in a phone call that he had missed a bus and was deciding to walk the 10-hour journey home but was lost and needed water and his phone <laughs> was on 1% battery. <laughs> sorry, I'm laughing. Sorry, 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 sorry. The rural Del Teno is about 40 minute drive from where Mr. Slater and his friends are staying. A remote and wild national park, it's a world away from Los Cristianos and the Playa del Americas and the party town holiday resort of the island's south coast. Deep ravines and huge daunting mountains make the national park a difficult place for the Spanish search team to navigate. At night, the countryside becomes a maze and pitch black and disorienting. So as you can see, as a picture of the police focusing on a bit of the rural village. You see the mountainous areas. You see all the big bushes, all the leaves and shit. It looks fucking crazy. 20th of June, the search starts in Masca Village. No, sorry, 17th of June. No, let's continue here. I did it wrong way around. 16th of June, he attended a festival at Playa de Americas, Jay Slater. On the 17th, um, calls friends from rural Del Teno Park the next day. On the 20th, the search begins. So they've been very rapid in terms of getting around him, right? He disappeared kind of on this between the 17th and 18th, and the search already began on for the 19th. So they've been quite on it, to be fair. One last bit. On Thursday, Miss Law called for the British police to join the forces to join the search story in the Canary Islands. In a statement released earlier, Lancashire police said that he had made an offer to support the Garda um, Civili the guard of Seville, sorry, to see if they needed additional resources, but had confirmed, <coughs> sorry, at this time, they are satisfied that they had the resources they need. Our thoughts remain with the Jay's family and friends at this distressing time. In Mr. Slater's hometown, people have been placing huge blue ribbons on the buildings in support of Mr. Slater and his family, and a prayer service were held on Thursday night at the West End Methodist Church. His friend Callum Thorpe, who has known him since primary, said initially he thought Slater had simply been at an after party and not turned up. However, he said that this time has gone by, the more serious it is getting scary now. I followed on social media and Facebook and it's getting more and more worrying. We all just want the best and to find out what we can. So 
This story seems pretty textbook on the surface, right? Young British teenager goes missing in a Spanish town somewhere. Maybe it's something harrowing. Maybe it's just him wandering off and getting lost somewhere and they're going to find him in some cave. But the extra details are the funny bit about it. If you search his name on Twitter, you will see numerous amounts of conspiracy theories that basically point to him maybe being involved in the trafficking of drugs maybe being a dealer himself maybe being involved in some dicey things in tenerife so much so people are hypothesizing that he may have run off on a plug he may have bought some drugs that he probably couldn't shift or like a real british teenager like a real englishman he bought some gear got it give it to him maybe on a free then he paid the dealer back but then like a good english british boy he ended up doing it all himself that happens quite often especially in england it happens way more often than it should do maybe because you don't have any guns and people know they're not going to die and shit but people getting stock from dealers and they're not selling it and they're just doing it themselves is a tale old as time which i think is probably more likely then you end up going crazy and walking around and getting lost but allegedly there's a rumor going around that some cartel some mob some gang in Tenerife have abducted him and they're trying to get the money back or they're trying to get their gear back or because the search has now become worldwide and come front you know front page news and because the kid's white and shit and everyone's going crazy over it the gang are feeling nervous and they may have done the unthinkable and rip the kid i'm hoping that's not true touch wood but the conspiracy behind it is legitimately fascinating bro go on fucking twitter now search his name jay slater and you will see uh an abundance of fucking conspiracy theories there's entire facebook groups set up with mums all across flipping england debating about whether or not this kid has actually been kidnapped and you know why they're debating it you know why they're debating it because of his mum because of his blood clot mum his mum appeared giving this video um testimony this video message in an appeal to get her son back and she doesn't seem that bothered let me know what you guys think to let him go he's not a bad person he's just got in maybe with some strangers who befriended him i'm not stupid i've been to tenerife before i've worked for all myself these were all the warnings that i gave to him as well um just think you've got him he's not a bad person he's just got in some i don't know if he has got him in trouble well you just let him go <laughs> <laughs> what what kind of what kind of response is this hold on let me put the sound up a little bit more just to let him go he's not a bad person he's just got in maybe with some strangers who befriended him i'm not stupid i've been to tenerife before i've worked for all myself these were all the warnings that i gave to him as well um just think you've got him he's not a bad person he's just got in some I don't know. If he has got him in What does this even mean? Like, what is she even talking about? He's a good person. He's got him with the right crowd, with the wrong crowd. I don't know if he has got him with the wrong crowd, but if he has got him with the wrong crowd, then just the wrong crowd. But he's a good... Like, what? Bro, your kid is missing. Your kid might have been abducted. Your kid might be D-E-A-D. Right? Your kid may be D-E-A-D. And you are out here saying... Oh, he's a good kid. He might have got in with the wrong crowd. Maybe he did it. Maybe he did. Maybe he did. Maybe he didn't. And this like fake crocodile cry thing that she's doing now, where she's like trying to sound like she's crying, but no tears are coming out. Now, again, it could be shock, right? Because, you know, in these situations, you don't know how you're going to react. But this mum seems very suspicious with how she's reacting. Very, very suspicious. Let him go. Just let him go. Everybody loves Jay. Everybody loves being in his company. He's bubbly and fun. And he's just so, he's just a lovely boy. A bonny, beautiful boy. He's, <laughs> and he's so lovely. He's darling today. Darling would be on his right back. Feeling, has somebody taken him? Has he just panicked? Where am I? You know, they've been in high spirits. They've been to um, an event. You know, I just thought, right, I need to go get... And the lack of eye contact with the camera too. The lack of eye contact with the camera. The lack of eye contact with the camera is also very, very concerning and telling. Maybe I'm reading too much into it,
but the lack of eye contact with the camera is making me think something doesn't smell too kosher here something smells a little bit fishy yo big up cali b big up cali b back down to civilize it but there is people up there why is nobody seen him you know there's tourists up there it's a climbing you know it's a hive of activity at 8 a.m in the morning and the search we know is going on again today yeah well, was <laughs> <it> <laughs> i can't bear to you see where we could be what just lying there somewhere i can't bear it <laughs> 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 I don't know about you, but I think that woman's full of shit. I'm not going to lie. I don't think this kid's missing. I think this is all a scam, mate. I think either the kid's been abducted by a gang or the kid went missing in order. I think the kid way might have went missing in order for them to run a GoFundMe scam. That's where my money's at. The kid hasn't gone missing, but they decided to run up a GoFundMe scam. Because at the moment, at the moment, at the time of recording, the current GoFundMe scam to get Sh Jay Slater home, heart emoji, is currently sitting at 35,000 pounds. Five grand over the target of 30K. That's what the current GoFundMe result is in. 35,000 pounds to get Jay Slater home. I think Jay Slater is in a warm, covered place somewhere in the mountainous region of Tenerife. He's got full Wi-Fi, access to his phone. But like a good boy, he's staying off of his phone. Maybe he hasn't logged into his Instagram. He's not liking anything on fucking Twitter. He's not retweeting anything. He's just biding his time before he pops out, looking a bit disheveled, maybe a little bit dehydrated, but he's perfectly fine. And they're going to pocket all that money. That's what I think is going on here. This is one of those clever scams. And the reason why I'm saying that is because there's a lot of people online, especially real legit English people, British people from up north and shit, real English people who are going out of their way to ruffle or to uncover this scam. And I'm thinking to myself, why are they doing this so much? Why, why don't they believe this woman? Why do these people online don't believe this mum? Why don't they believe her? And it made me think, oh, because scammers recognize scammers. So these other mums are pissed that they never thought of this idea of having their teenage son go missing, quote unquote, in some mountainous area of fucking Spain, set up a go for me to find them, pocket the money, and then welcome the son back with open arms like nothing fucking went wrong. They're pissed. They didn't come up with a scam. That's why they're going out of their way to uncover this because they know scammer recognize scammers. They know what's going on because clearly this kid isn't missing. You know why I say that? Somebody, I saw somebody online say, I'm not too sure where it came from. This might be a rumor, but allegedly there's been information leaked from the Spanish side that Jay Slater logged into his Instagram account. <laughs> Now, this kid's 19 years old. Name me another 19 year old, a boy especially, that would ever let anybody apart from themselves have access to the Instagram account. Not possible. So allegedly, his Instagram account was logged into the other day <laughs> while he was missing. <laughs> so something is definitely up. I don't know what it is, but something is definitely up. The only way this is not going to be up, unfortunately, the only way you're going to disprove this theory, the only way you're going to quell all the fucking conspiracy theories is if the worst thing happens, which we don't want to say. But it's looking more and more likely like this was some sort of coordinated approach to just get money from people and shit. It was some sort of hustle, some sort of game. Let's read the actual blurb for the GoFundMe. This is the blurb for the GoFundMe. Hi, everyone. My name is Lucy, and Lucy, by the way, is this lady here, right? This is Lucy. Very chirpy, right? A very chirpy message, considering, opening line, considering it's a GoFundMe for your missing child in a foreign country somewhere, especially with the history of, like, you know, British people who go missing in foreign countries. You'd imagine you'd be a lot more concerned. But anyway, chirpy. Hiya! So, 
Hi everyone, my name is Lucy. I've come on holiday to Tenerife to attend the NRG festival with my friend Jay and another friend. On the no, sorry, Lucy's another person. That's I apologize. Lucy is a friend. Lucy isn't a mum. The mum is Debbie Duncan. I apologize. Let's go back again. Hi everyone, my name is Lucy. I've come on holiday on Tenerife to attend the NRG festival with my friend Jay and another friend. On the last day of the festival, I left alone earlier than everyone else because I was tired from the weekend. I woke up to a phone... By the way, this is a very white thing as well. If this is true, this is a very white English thing. Imagine all of you as friends are going to a festival and there's girls also in your friendship group and you just leave, not as a group, but individually. So you go with a group, but then you just leave individually. Why would you let a girl go home by herself anyway, as a guy, even if it's your, your friend? Go back with her. If it's me and we're going on festivals, or we're going to a party or a restaurant or a bar, you go together, you leave together. All this leaving individually, the French exits of the festivals, it's so bizarre, but it's a very English, British thing to do. To go somewhere and just leave your friends and not say bye. It's like, what? Now look what's happened. I woke up to a phone call off Jay at 8.30 a.m. saying he's lost in the mountains and he wasn't aware of his surroundings. He desperately needed a drink and his phone was a 1%. <laughs> I'm sorry, but imagine being lost somewhere in the mountains of Tenerife and instead of trying to figure out where you are, you call somebody to get your butt. Like, what are they going to do? How are they going to find you? If you can't, like, you're better off trying to get to a road then you are trying to call your friend's 1% battery. Use your 1% battery to find the nearest road and then just walk there and just stand there and wait for someone. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know, whatever. He had met two people on Sunday night and left with them to go to their apartment. Their apartment was miles away from the civilization and in a very secluded location. I wonder what those people looked like. I wonder if they were Coca-Cola. I wonder. He left at 8 a.m. and walked half an hour before frantically ringing me when his phone reached 1%. <laughs> this was three days ago now, and no one has seen or heard from him since. Now, I'm laughing. I know I'm being a little bit facetious. I'm being a little bit cruel. If this guy's dead, I'm going to feel bad. Not really. I don't really know him, so I don't really give a fuck. But if he is going to feel dead, I'm going to feel slightly bad for laughing. But if this is a scam, if this is all a ruse, to get 35 grand out of the public and pull at their heartstrings. Fair play. Fair play. Fair fucking play. His last location was off was off-road track. Was on an off-road track, sorry. Which is a 10-hour walk from his host hotel. <laughs> 10 hour walk from his hotel. The weather conditions up there are terrible for someone in shorts and a t-shirt, both in day and at night. He has no water for when it's warm and throughout the day. And he has no coat or suitable clothing for when it's cold at night. It's one degree and extremely windy when he's out looking in the middle of the night. We're also worried and just want him home. Please help if you can. Share far and wide. Thank you for reading. I think they're full of shit, bro. I think they're completely full of shit. And I think this is a fucking scam. Look at the fucking mum, bro. Look at the mum. Look at the mum. Imagine for one second you are Jay Slater and imagine you went missing in a foreign country when you were 19. Oh, he's not a bad person. He's just got in maybe with some strangers who befriended him. I'm not stupid. I've been to Tenerife before. I've worked for myself. These were all the warnings that I gave to him as well. Um, just think you've got him. He's not a bad person. He's just got and the, And the thing that's very telling for me is this. Because I don't think... There's another theory, right? The other theory is this. The other theory is that the kid just got involved with some dicey people. Getting involved with dicey people doesn't mean you deserve to die. But I guess the family won't like that information to get out there because people's concentration or focus will get taken away from what's actually going on and the kid's missing. So it doesn't matter that he might have got... Because I think there's a story going around in the Telegraph that he was let off for some crazy crime where him and his friends attacked some kid and they hit him over the head with a machete and allegedly his brain was exposed and somehow all the kids got off. They didn't do any time and shit, right? Crazy, whatever. Happens all the time, right? It's not that big of a deal, but I guess because they were white, everyone's looking at it like, oh my God, they're white kids, they got away with it. But these things happen sometimes in court cases, right? Where sometimes somebody deserves to get a, a hefty sentence for doing something crazy, but they get away with it. It might have been because there were kids as well at the time, who knows? But I think... If that's to be believed, that's kind of the thing that he does, imagine. 
and he might be involved in some, you know, selling of whatever. It's not far-fetched to understand that maybe the reason why he's missing is because he got involved with some dicey people. Maybe, you know, you get a little bit of an intimidating drive back somewhere. They ask you for the fucking drugs. You don't know where they are. And they decide to drop you off somewhere random because they're pissed off and they want you to learn your lesson. Right? Cool. That could possibly be the thing. But I think it would have been helpful to quell all the conspiracy theories if that was kind of like put out there. His background and what, you know what I mean? Just to kind of, because all the conspiracy theories are making this a lot more complex than it needs to be. Because he could be genuinely missing, genuinely be abducted, genuinely be in harm's way. But because of all this other stuff going on, people are like, I don't know. And now people like myself are looking at the GoFundMe thinking, is this a scam? When maybe it isn't. Do you know what I mean? And you could imagine, 35 grand anyway, if we're being honest too, for a search type thing, to, to make sure your kid comes back home safe, whatever else resources you're going to pay for, PIs, it doesn't really go that far, really and truly, right? Flights, whatever, like all anything that, that, go, that goes with trying to locate somebody in a foreign country and trying to, because I remember reading some article, I forgot who it was about, really tragic one, about some girl that passed away a, a, like... I think it might have been some girl that went backpacking. I forgot where it was. But essentially, the person said, the I remember the family member basically saying that the majority of the GoFundMe went to the cost of getting the body transported back to the UK. That's how scary it is. Allegedly, like it cost so much money and there was so much red tape just involved with getting their kid's body back from wherever they passed away. So imagine you're dealing with that tragedy anyway. You're trying to, you know, do, what do you call it? Um, trying to liaise with a cut with another country's police force and missing people's department most likely in some especially Tenerife maybe in the major cities or in the main center everyone speaks English but the further out you go it gets more rural and it gets more Spanish people don't so you're having to conversate people in a language that you don't know if something tragic happens like all that shit is like it gets involved in it so maybe the 35 grand that I'm looking at it isn't as much as you'd think it is but, but, I still would say, just from being a fucking armchair psychologist, this woman's reaction is a little bit dicey for me. Maybe she's in shock. Maybe she just doesn't know what to say. No one's, you know, she's got a fucking camera crew outside of her house trying to interview her while she's thinking about her son and shit. I get it. But her reaction is a little bit dicey. Just for me. Just for me. Some, I don't know, if he has got him in trouble. Well, you just let him go. Just let him go. Everybody loves Jay. Everybody loves being in his company. He's bubbly and fun. And he's just so, he's just a lovely boy. A bonny beautiful boy. <laughs> and he was supposed to fly home from this island today. Now we would have been on a flight back. Feeling, has somebody taken him? Has he just panic where am I you know they've been in nice spirits they've been to um, an event you know as I just thought right, I need to go get back down to civilize it but there is people up there why has nobody seen him you know there's tourists up there it's a climbing you know it's a hive of activity at 8am in the morning and the search we know is going on again today yeah would you be taking part in that i can't do it you see where we could be what just lying there somewhere i can't bear it i don't have the strength to do it but yo big up my guy stoic savage wild one wild one wild one stoic savage wild one everyone in the chat wild one bro laughing at the mouth is a bad look hey, 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 hey. allow me allow me I got wrapped up in the conspiracies. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm searching Jay Slater. I'm seeing all the memes. Allow me, allow me. It's going to be mad. It's going to be mad. It's going to be mad if we all end up eating crow. If this ends up being similar to the Kate Middleton situation. Remember Kate Middleton? When she went quote unquote missing and everyone was worried for her and saying where's Kate? And then we saw her somewhere and everyone was pretending, acting like she got fucking BBL or that she got she got some other cosmetic surgery and shit. All these conspiracy theories are running around town. And they put out that picture that was clearly taken from a while back ago. And then, of course, it got revealed or she came out and said that she was obviously battling cancer and then everyone felt bad, right? The whole internet, myself included, felt really bad because we all partook in this 
meme and this like you know troll of her going um you know to fucking miami to go get a bum a bum did and shit so if this ends up being true i'm gonna feel horrible but in this particular moment i have to laugh i have to just to make light of this and to kind of quell my anxiety and stuff i have to big up omar ramos as well i see you big up don dota i see you big up um lebo i see you too um bad mind but the mum does look a bit disingenuous but how do you deal with grief everyone is different yeah for sure like i said like it be to be fair in the beginning of the video she does look a little bit you know worse for wear like she's been up all night she looks tired you know what i mean she just she definitely does look a little bit like just shocked and how to deal with it and again no one tells anybody how they should deal with grief she's having to contend with she's having to deal with a million things at the same time right probably the reason why she's not doing the gofundme herself but i don't know man something inside of me is just like this seems a bit fishy and again it could be based on nothing but just twitter memes and trolls it could be nothing i could be talking out of my absolute derriere i'm sure and i'm aware of it but right now it's looking kind of dicey but still hopefully jay slater makes his way back home hopefully we get some explanation as to what happened um hopefully if it is true that he did get involved with some dicey people i hope they also announce that and like make it a bit of a warning thing and use it as a cautionary tale like imagine if he did actually put himself in harm's way by getting involved with some dealers and shit let it be known so that other kids can know hey this isn't the right way to go about things because it can end up being quite you know it could end up being a tragic situation for you in the end so hoping he comes out home safe hoping it's not you know what people are saying it is and no hoping it's not as bad as it, it could be but if it is a scam then that's a good thing because it means he's safe and he's fine but if it isn't a scam then hopefully they can use that money to get the kid back home safe and sound sometime soon i've been thinking a lot about doing things pro bono i've been thinking a lot about people doing things for the love of the game just for the love of the game just simply for the love of the game i don't think it happens often enough nowadays everyone wants to do things i feel like nowadays whenever somebody wants to do something or whenever someone wants to do a yeah a project whatever the the usual answer or the usual retort what's the budget right what's the budget what's the budget even your friends nowadays i'm assuming some people's friends nowadays when they get you know they want payment for helping you move and shit or whatever like it just feels like everybody's in it for the money no one's doing anything for the love of the game so the reason why i say that is because i saw this tweet courtesy of my cody right a girl that i absolutely love this lady that dj heidi lorden legendary house dj or house disco you know just all around party dj so she tweeted this earlier does anybody actually get paid money to dj at glastonbury and i guess judging by the replies from other djs it seems as if glastonbury don't pay they do it on like a oh my god this is going to be great exposure for you it's glastonbury it's a legendary uk festival it's a legendary world festival you're going to want to be there you never know what you could do for your career blah 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 now this makes sense because the dj lineup for glastonbury is fucking insane They've got amazing bands anyway. You know that to be true. But the DJ Olympic itself, at, what is it, NYC Down Low, is probably worth the ticket, the price of admission. So I always thought to myself, how could they afford to pay all those headliners and pay all those DJs? It doesn't make sense. Especially when you hear of some of the crazy, ridiculous fees that some of the DJs charge. It doesn't make sense how they were to, 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 you know, to be able to afford both things. But now I'm led to believe that most likely they pay their main headliners but other people in the lineup they just do it for free or for a nominal fee or maybe they cover their transport and their you know whatever it may be that makes a lot of sense hence why they have such a great lineup of djs because everyone wants to do it because it's a great look so i'm wondering to myself do you need to get paid to DJ at, a dj at glastonbury can't there be like one or two things that you do as an artist as a dj as a musician right they just do for the fun of it shouldn't there be like one or two gigs that you do or one or two festivals or clubs or whatever that you say hey if they ever called me i'll do it for free just because it's something that you may be fair in love with maybe your first festival ever was at this one place maybe this first club that you went to was in this one country and you're like if this place hollers at me i will do it for free and i will do it an extended set 
just because I love the place so much, I want to kind of give back and inspire maybe the next generation. Why don't people do that? Why is it always have to be about money? You know, and maybe that's the reason why Gastonbury's become and is still such a well-regarded legendary festival. Why they're able to take a year off and come back and it still sells out. While tickets are still sold out now. There's a video I saw recently of some kid from last year dressed up as a woman because he bought a ticket from somebody else because the ticket situation at Gastonbury is fucking insane. You have to basically take a picture of yourself, pre-register, then you have to buy the ticket at a certain time. But then when your ticket comes, it has your picture on it. It's fucking wild. So there's no real easy way to transfer tickets, right? Unless you look like the person. So this one kid, there's a video of this one young kid who turns up to the festival in a full wig and hat and shit and makeup trying to get in. And there's vlogs of YouTubers trying loads of really out there methods to get in glass for free, jumping over gates, you know, flying in, going underneath it and stuff like it's oh, crazy, right? The demand for glass and is wild. If that's the case, why don't people just play for free? Play for free because clearly the demand and the people that are going to be there is going to be way worth. It's going to be more. It's going to be more worth to you than the booking fee. Because if you're a professional DJ, in my opinion, this is my humble opinion here. The fact that you're getting asked, the fact that you're getting requested, the fact that you're getting hit up to play at Gastonbury, in my opinion, would lead me to believe that you're either a full-time DJ or you're semi-professional in that you might have a part-time job to kind of, you know, um, add to the income. But you're at a level where you play other spots and gigs around the year that pay far more. So why are you worried about the Gastonbury pay? If you're a up and coming DJ like myself and you don't get many gigs this is the one gig you get fair enough I can understand why you'd want to get paid but still the look is worth it the look of playing there should be way worth it in my humble opinion but again what do I know let's read some of the replies somebody said here um, uh, let's see some of the replies um, somebody said here we were paid but we were also playing on the smaller stage at Blockline District which is basically the queer annex of Glastonbury a sort of utopia temporal space a caring micro niche gay bubble um, another one says I had offers this from Platis Plastician big up Plastician I had offers to play this year but none could even offer a wristband so I essentially was paid to play Last year, I did get paid, though, and then had further offers from other stages to play for perks. Camper position in good camp, free booze, VIP access when playing gigs. Is that, isn't that okay? Isn't that okay? Isn't that okay to be a DJ and get offered, pay f to have like a pay-for-play option? Where maybe you get, because I think one of the things I've read as well is that allegedly, that's going to be a very tight with wristbands, which is a bit wild. So they ask you to pay for free or play for free, but then they won't give you an extra wristband for your friend. That's a bit insane. That's a little bit insane, right? Like you don't even get one extra wristband for like your boyfriend, your husband, your Cody, your road man. Like, come on, at least one. They don't give you one. Cool. That's a bit aggressive. That's a bit of a piss take. But the offer for a camper free, like that's pretty good, especially for a lucrative festival because a lot of DJs also, when they go to Gastonbury, or when they play at Gastonbury, they stay. They actually enjoy the festival. So it's not like they just go and just leave after they're set. They actually don't mind hanging out because it's a great festival. You might see great artists, great bands and shit. It all makes sense. Another person here. Uh, big up Chloe Robinson. Big up Chloe Robinson. Big up Chloe Robinson. Yes, every year for me, except this one, certain stages have budgets, others don't. Which again is fair. And I personally think you should have a list of things that you are willing to do for free just for the love of the game, especially if you're a professional DJ. Sorry. Some of these DJs get paid way too much money. I'm not a, a pocket watcher and shit, but being a DJ myself, the fact that some of these guys are getting paid like 10 grand for one set and you're playing someone else's music and some of the time the mix is terrible and some of the time you don't actually like look like you want to be there and some of the time your head's down the whole entire time and some of the time you can't even smile while you're fucking playing. And you're getting paid 10 grand, 10 grand for like a one hour set, a two hour set. So, and then you can't play one set a year at Glastonbury for free. And then you also get the chance to maybe get some free booze. You get all access past fucking wristband. You get to see all the, your greatest fucking artists in the world performing at one of the best festivals in the world up front and close. That's priceless. I think so. But again, maybe because I'm at the lower rungs, anything, any opportunity, I'm fucking grasping at it and running to it. Maybe. 
Another person says here, um, and most mid-lower tier DJs actually have to buy tickets to play there or be part of the quote-unquote crew. I've been asked to play a couple of bars across, but only if I already have a ticket. Thanks, but no thanks. Okay, that's understandable. Again, I think the ticket thing is understandable because it's such an in-demand festival. Because there's so much demand for it. Because imagine the amount of people who hit up the organisers and people that work for Glastonbury to get tickets. Forget the ones that go on sale. Imagine the ones that know somebody that works there. I know the owner. I know the da 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 Imagine how many requests they get before even tickets are getting on fucking sale. So they definitely oversell. That's some real. Cool. So because of that, they have to kind of temper, you know, how many tickets they give away at the end. Maybe they should put the priority to give away tickets or to give extra tickets to artists and shit. And that would maybe guarantee them. Like imagine if they were able to confirm and guarantee an artist or a DJ gets an extra wristband if they come and play for free. Maybe it might increase their chances to book more people. You never know. But I do understand that if they ask you to pay for a ticket or they said, hey, you can only play if you already bought one, it's a little bit cheeky. Another person says here, it has most people know, it has cost most people I know to play. They also won't even give people a second wristbands for their drivers to get there with them. Okay, that's a bit dumb, to be fair. You don't need a wristband for your driver. You can just get an Uber to travel there. You don't need somebody. You know I mean, you don't need your own driver to fucking drive you to Glastonbury. Just get an Uber or jump in a coach or something. It's not, it's not that deep. But a second wristband for your boyfriend, your partner or something, that should be fucking, that should be standard, to be fair. Another person. This year and last year, I had to route it with some other shows that previously or following weekends so that losing money on the trip. If I could not do this, I wouldn't do this. Another one says, I turned it down for the same reasons as I have two previous times. This offer was even worse than the two previous ones. Like I'm going to say, yes, living in Southeast Asia, it would have cost me five times more than the fee at least. No thanks, I'm good. But again, this is one of those rare instances where I think exposure matters. Because this person's a DJ from Southeast Asia. I don't know who they are. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm very oblivious to who this person called Ant TC1 is. But let's imagine Ant TC1 is a big Southeast DJ. South Asian DJ, right? Cool. But they're not big on the worldwide stage. Maybe, maybe, maybe. I, I think they can be quite big, right? If they're a Metalhead's label manager, most likely they're well-known. But let's say they're not a well-known person. Maybe it might be worthwhile for you to travel to london or to the uk and go to Gastonbury and pay five times more for the fucking travel because you never know you might get five times more business that later down the line that could be a calculated risk to take it could be another one says a tiny fee plus ticket is a norm even on the main stage another one says i did last year but offers this year included either fee or no fee or no tickets or apparently decline and i'm imagining this what this girl said is very illuminating because this makes me this makes it seem like most likely what's happening is that this year because the cost of living the energy cost whatever has gone up maybe Glastonbury are trying to you know save some money where they can because it all adds up because again the DJ lineup list for Glastonbury is probably a hundred DJs deep so if they can save you know fifty euros a hundred euros a grand on each DJ it does add up. So, if they offered you money every other year, but then this year in particular they said no money, surely you just take the deal. Surely. Because you know they're usually good for it, just this year they're not. Because if I'm not mistaken, Gastonbury next year is cancelled. Gastonbury next year isn't even on. So maybe this might be a good way to kind of get your, your foot in the door. Who knows? Another one says, my band gets 10% of our normal fee and I'm now refusing to come back unless that's drastically improved. Yeah, but again... I think the look is worth it. Another person says, I did it too until I was offered a fee last year and this year. Okay, so this person um, called Joy T. Singh says that they weren't offered a fee. They didn't get offered a fee. They didn't play. The moment they offered them a fee, they started to play. Let's see the other replies here. Um, and then DJ Heidi Lorden replied to this Joy T. Singh and said, good for you. I wish more take this approach. So ultimately everyone's time work is appreciated. Okay, cool. I get the holistic approach. Maybe as professional DJs, she's kind of asking and sort of like fielding this question because the hope is if everybody declines to play for free, it will force Gastonbury to pay everybody, right? 
almost i'd imagine but knowing djs the way i know djs and knowing the scene the way i know the scene because there's so far few opportunities available there's probably going to be a queue of a million djs who would happily pay for free obviously glastonbury wants the names that's why they're offering the free pay to pay for play gigs to the professional djs because they want them to play for free but they also want their notoriety to get people to go and buy tickets and shit but if ever all these djs were to collectively you know organize and decide we're not going to play for Gatsonbury ever again we're kind of going quote unquote strike because they don't pay us there will be a queue of ten thousand plus djs willing to take up their spots willing to because there's so little opportunities out there anyway joy T continues 100 percent. however i sometimes wonder if it's because i'm not british born and raised and therefore don't see glasto <clears throat> as such much of a as much of my heritage or coming of age story as others okay maybe that's true maybe there are some people who's like myself who see glastonbury as this like amazing thing that should be put on the fucking pulpit and maybe you're willing to take more shit it's like how i view Bergheim. allegedly Bergheim has the same sort of thing i think Bergheim has a nominal fee they, they pay everybody across the board which I, I hope is true but i remember hearing that from somebody that allegedly Bergheim pays all djs the same fee across the board no one gets more no one gets less um and uh, the idea behind it is that because that Bergheim is the best club in the world you want to play there so you want that honor of playing there the feed is not really imp important you get to play for six hours you get to play in one of the best sound systems in one of the best clubs in the world in front of one of the best audiences so that kind of you know balances out a bit so that might be the case another person here says reading all the very interesting comments below it looks to me that dj at glastonbury is sort of a strike breaking a bite that some may take it as a sort of a promotion which it is still but no fee by the way is also standard for artists performing at likes of south by southwest and warmix so i guess the annoying thing about this sort of stuff which i understand if a professional dj if you don't agree to a fee or if you don't demand one you'll know you know deep down someone else is getting paid these sort of events have budgets they just decide on who gets the budget who doesn't so if you say that you're happy not to get a fee it's gonna not sit right with you when you find out what somebody else is getting you know when you pay for free and they're getting however much they're getting so i understand i understand another person says i know some very well-known djs on the circuit not gonna name any names who told me several years ago that they do it every year for free beggars believe but i guess they believe it's good pr to be there playing every year um dj Hadi lorden um replies for free or break even i get if it's easy for you and it's your choice it's promo for something else but it seems a lot essentially paying for to play i don't think it's a bad thing man i honestly don't think it's a bad thing glastonbury is one of the best festivals allegedly i've never been myself but judging from the videos judging from what people say it does look fucking amazing it looks almost magical the thing i like most about glastonbury looking from the outside in is the fact that there's so many there's such a variety in age ranges people go there with their families with literal babies and shit people go there with their te with in groups of teenagers young people whatever it really does cover the spectrum all the way from like toddlers to fucking old age pensions and shit which i think is the genesis of a festival i don't think gen festivals should always be dominated by like 25 to 40 35 year olds it should be a little bit more of a broad range because you know it's an outdoor open air sort of things that would allow people that generally probably wouldn't want to go to nightclubs to go to festivals so the fact that that doesn't happen anymore is really annoying and the fact that festivals are normally steered towards younger people is really annoying too because there's a whole spectrum of people out there who are into the same sort of music anyway with that being said gasenby is clearly a great platform to promote yourself and to just as just a thing to put on your fucking list of of accomplishments oh my god i played there so playing for free i think isn't that much of a bad thing especially um if you want to you know progress or if you already have gigs if you're already a touring dj i don't think there's any excuse to have one or two gigs on your lineup that you don't you know worry about fee but i think in general i don't know what it is maybe it's the money maybe it's the travel also that's another thing but from what i've been able to see reading between the lines djs don't miss their pay similar to comedians djs will not play for nothing especially the professional ones even though they get paid a lot they get paid 10 grand plus for one hour sets and stuff they don't care if you want to book them you have to pay if you don't pay they don't come 
So I wonder if a lot of that has to do with the fact that they have such crazy schedules. They're flying in on a Friday in one location. Then they're flying out the Friday evening to another location. They've never seen the city. They've never seen their friends. They miss weddings, miss funerals, miss birthday parties, miss promotions, baby showers, all missing because you're away and up and around. Then by the time you come back in the midweek, your friends are working. They can't hang out. So it's quite a you know, stressful, lonely occupation. So maybe that's why DJs are very money focused. Like, no, 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 no. I'm already killing myself. I'm already missing loads of time out of my family. I'm not gonna now take a job for free and then be away from people that I love. Do you know what I mean? If you're gonna if you're gonna make me leave my home and not see my children or not see my cat, my dog, whatever it may be, you have to make it worth my while. Maybe that's the way they go around it. Maybe. Another person. Most bands, even though they get paid and are on the main stage, lose money when playing Gastonbury. Another person says here, I think it depends on which stage you're in and who's running the stage, i.e. if you're a bigger stage and booked by Glasgow themselves, then yes. But if you're a smallest book stage by the crew who've been asked to book it, then no. Oh, OK, I understand that. That makes a lot of sense. So Glastonbury have their own booking system, but then they also book crew collectives party organizers just djs and maybe they want to do something interesting so they go out and reach out to their own networks to get more people to play on the their set on their stage that's quite cool that's quite a cool idea so in that regard that makes sense there won't be no budget because the budget they're getting paid to organize a stage is just enough to cover the cost of like organizing the stage do you know what I mean? So expecting payment for that is a bit dumb. Another person says, pretty sure the superstar DJ will. Blah, 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 blah. So I guess um, I thought the justification for nope is most of the ticket sales go to charity. Is it? Okay. I don't know about that one. I don't buy this. I don't buy this idea that they don't pay fees or they pay very low fees for charity donations. I think most likely, I think most likely, I think most, oh, big up Crystal Mess as well. Big up Crystal Mess. Brilliant response. Nope. That's why I said no, because I'm about my money. Big up Crystal Mess. Very clear and very to the point. But I don't think the charity thing is true. I think most likely they don't want to pay fees or high fees because a festival lineup mostly is very bloated. You probably have 50 plus people playing there, not including bands. So it's just not going to make sense, viable sense for you to be able to pay everybody their actual fee and run a good festival. And from what I've been hearing and reading between the lines and watching interviews, listen to podcasts, people that organize festivals say, by and large, especially unless they're like big, you know, or, um, operations that are backed by fucking credit card companies and shit, most festivals are done for the love of the game. Most festivals are done purely for the love of the game. You know, they just want to put on a festival. They want to put on a fun time for their community, for their friends, for their social circle. They want to create moments. They just want to be a part of the scene. That's it. And they're literally breaking even. Sometimes they're not making any money. So if that's the case, then paying everybody their fee, it's not going to make it viable. So you're kind of hoping that people would want to play a festival because it's such a good time and because it could maybe help them in the future that they're going to pay for free. It's almost similar to like Boiler Room. Boiler Room had the same sort of problem. When Boiler Room was kind of going, before they got bought out by Dice, I remember seeing a lot of DJs complaining that Boiler Room wasn't paying them. And I was wondering to myself, like, hold on. I follow a bunch of DJs online, especially on YouTube. I'm subscribed to a lot of their channels. Some of these DJs will go on live on their own channel and they legitimately won't get like 50 views on the live stream of them mixing. So clearly, it's very difficult to get people to view your live stream, to view your videos on YouTube. So Boiler Room has spent a lot of time cultivating and building their platform, building their channel. So I think it's perfectly okay for them to say, hey, do you want to play in front of our millions and millions of people audience? Potentially maybe put yourself in a shop window to get further gigs. Maybe, you know, broaden your horizons to get bigger and get more fans around the world. Yeah, then yeah, then play for free. I think that's a fair exchange. You play on one of the biggest live streaming DJ platforms out there. You get some good fucking clout points, you know, and Bob your uncle, Grand Juran. I don't think there's many people who can say that they've appeared on Boiler Room and their career hasn't gone up a level. Do you know what I mean? Most people do kind of capitalize or do use that look as opportunity to kind of, you know, as a kind of launching pad. So I think that's perfectly okay. And I think it's also okay to put that money that you would have spent on DJs into the running of the festival. So far from people, again, look even look at that fucking cover image 
there's this incredible hill area in Glastonbury where they have these letters all stood up that spell out Glastonbury. People sit there and chill out and shit. They've got a million street food places. There's a million places to go piss, sit down, drink, whatever it may be. So clearly they are reinvesting the funds that they make into the running of the festival. And I don't really hear people complaining about the festival. All you hear are people complaining about, you know, getting in and getting out, but that's standard to all festivals. It's going to be a big queue. But if the, if, if, if the actual product is improved, by them not paying exorbitant fees, I think it's completely okay. And finally, I think it's necessary for the scene and for just enjoyment purposes in general, for some DJs to be like, hey, I'm okay to perform at this festival for free because I love the festival. I think there should be more of that. There should be more of people doing things just for the love of it, not doing everything for a paycheck because that's why some of the art that we see nowadays is a bit shit. Because people aren't doing things for fun. They're doing things only because it benefits their bottom line, which I understand. You need to get paid. You've got family to look after. You've got bills to pay. I get it. But if you're a professional DJ, if you're a professional artist and you get paid anyway, what's the harm of doing one thing for free? Just for the look. Just for the scene. Just to quote unquote give back. Come on, man. Don't be so greedy. Don't be so greedy. Hey, yo, big up the stream chat. Well, go on, my guy, Rodeo Brito. Wagwan Zell, Wagwan Don Dotter, Wagwan Mr. Bob Dobalania. What's good? What's happening? Hope you're well. Hope you're well. Flexing on the throw, bro. Yeah, big up you. Wagwan Don Dotter would be cool if Gassenbury would do an electronic only weekend, similar to Primavera Sound. Yeah, very, very true in that one. To be fair, I kind of prefer how they don't do that. I think it's they do enough clubby type of things anyway. And if you want the Primavera Sound thing, you go Primavera Sound. That's what I liked about it. Like As much as I enjoyed Primavera when I went, I didn't get the feeling that it was like Glastonbury. You know? It didn't feel like it was like Glastonbury. It felt like a, you know, a different festival. Controversial opinion. I'm fed up of these warnings. I'm fed up of these warnings. Telling people, oh my God, there's a particular batch of pills out on the market now. They're really strong. Be careful. At this point, enough people have died from taking very strong mdma pills without drinking without hydrating without eating and shit just doing the common mistakes people do or maybe getting a bad batch enough kids have died in the last few years if you don't know this already to take it easy or to be chill or to maybe get your pill and break it up because most pills especially if you see here on this image have a break line when they press it and if you want, you can usually break it in half and then take it that way. Or if you're like me, you break it in quarters. But there's no no reason why anyone who's not experienced with drugs should be taking a very strong pill to the face, the whole one, without drinking, without eating or anything and expecting it to be a good time. If you don't know that yet, then you deserve whatever comes your way. You don't need people to constantly give you warnings. And there's another thing to be said for if you take drugs in the first place, you're rolling the dice. It doesn't matter where you get it from, who your dealer is, how pure allegedly they say it is. If you take drugs, you're always running the risk that you're putting your life in danger, in life in harm's way. To avoid the issues, just don't do drugs. That's the only way to 100% guarantee yourself that you're going to be okay when you go to Gassenbury. Just get on the drinks. Maybe have a little vape pen. Maybe have some weed and shit. But if you get under class A's, you're rolling the dice with your life. So warnings and heads ups about super strength pills are really dumb. Because at this point, if you don't know, you're the dummy. If you take it and something goes wrong, you're the idiot. Because there's so many examples, so many tragic stories of kids going to festivals, taking too much and it ending fatally. If you don't know by now, no amount of warning is going to fucking help you. Let's read the article anyway. The Loop have issued a warning over super strength pills in circulation around the UK. The pills containing up to two, three, sorry, three times the average dose of MDMA have been found tested samples by harm reduction and organization The Loop. I wonder which ones they are. I might have to keep an eye out for them. The Loop launched a campaign called Size Matters earlier today, drawing attention to the return of a high strength ecstasy pill, which is also often bigger in size. Oi, they've got those, you know those fucking paracetamols that you get from abroad especially in europe and shit you get those fat paras because in the uk they give you a little baby one but you europeans you know 
they give you those fat paracetamol. Sometimes they're like high MGs. That's why sometimes you get those pills that way. They press them in like a massive cube. Those literally like an ice cube. Those things you should break up. Those things you should take in moderation. Maybe sprinkle in a drink or something. Don't go too crazy because that that will put you on your feet. That will put you on your fucking ass, not on your feet. It continues. Of the 150 plus products sold as MDMA by The Loop this year, it found that the average strength of pills significantly increased back to the pre-pandemic levels. So this is interesting. This is maybe proof that we're currently back. Because there was a period in time during the pandemic, or just post-pandemic actually, where life was getting back to normal. I remember reading an article, I forgot what the ingredient was, but allegedly there was some sort of ingredient that is an essential to the manufacturing of MDMA that allegedly was a legal thing. And I think you got it from China. There's some sort of chemical, I'm not sure what it was. And allegedly, because of COVID and all the restrictions and shit, that particular material couldn't or ingredient couldn't get imported into parts of Europe, which is why for a period of time, post pandemic, the pills in Europe specifically, either it was dry or they were really bad quality because they weren't able to get this one key ingredient that is meant to be the key ingredient to making MDMA pills what they are. Maybe it's a binding agent. I'm not really too sure, but I remember that being a big deal. So the fact that we're now back to these levels, as they say here, right, means that maybe those drugs are able to get transported now again or they find an alternative. It continues. An average strength of more than 180 per pill was discovered, while on one pill, the strength was more than 250, around three times the average dose of MDMA. The highest one I've ever seen people take when I was out in clubs and shit a lot was 325, I think, MG or something. I forgot. But I remember there was one particular one. What was it? I think it was like the IKEA one. Really cool design as well. It's like the IKEA logo. It was like a rectangle and it had the uh, blue and the yellow. So it's like a split design. That was a pretty high strength one as well. Um, there was that blue one. I forgot what it was called. I think it's Punisher. That was really super strength as well. That was taking people out. But essentially the deal or the the approach should always be, no matter how experienced you are, inexperienced you are, don't ever take a whole pill straight to the face. Break it up, at least in half. See how you feel after half an hour, then take the second dose. But sometimes if you just take the full one to the face without anything in your stomach, it can end in tragedy. It continues. Total pill weight can be a simple indicator of the high strength pills and a flag up to need to extra caution. It says here, um, there, there is the, okay, is that the pill? There's a pill here, courtesy of the Loops Instagram account. Uh, size matters. What does it say here? The Loop has tested over 150 pills sold as MDMA this year and found that the average strength actually pills significantly increased. Um, average strength in 2024 is 181 mg. Um, products with M no MDMA is 2%. Harm reduction advice. The loops testing shows that bigger pills are more likely to be stronger. Take a quarter, slowly sip water. Exactly like I said. Avoid redosing for 90 plus minutes. Wow, really? I thought it was half an hour. They, they, they recommend not, not to do another dose for, for an hour, more than an hour. Shit. <laughs> I'm lucky to be alive. It continues. Take breaks from dancing and if possible, sit in the shade, in the shade if it's sunny. Seek medical help if you or your mates feel unwell. You won't get in trouble. Uh, it depends what club you're in, to be fair. Um, similar looking products can be different sizes and strengths and even different drugs. The Loop will be testing drugs in the summer, both at festivals in Bristol, within our home office licensed labs. So please follow our socials for latest information. So again, like I said, I think you have to be a bit of a dummy nowadays to get done up by high strength pills. Um, just take small bits, see how it goes, and then kind of roll with the punches and then kind of roll with the punches i have to admit i have to admit maybe i'm very dumb and naive but only in the last few years have i started to understand the concept of like i think it's is it downgrading i think someone called it i think it's called dialing down but essentially i remember somebody telling me this right where essentially when they go to festivals or they go to club nights they also pre-plan the other day on the other side so for instance if they decide to go to a place like berlin for the weekend they already plan out what they're going to do after they leave Bergheim Sunday morning or Monday morning. So maybe they'll get a flight out on a Wednesday or a Tuesday. They won't do what I usually do where I fly in on Friday and leave on Monday. 
which means I literally leave the rave and then go to the airport, you know, all bleary eyed and fucking, you know, twitching all over the place. So my friend basically said, no, we actually plan it around it. So we plan the actual exit of the festival just as well as we plan going there. And the whole idea behind it is that you get time to quote unquote sober up, chill, eat some healthy food, maybe get a couple nights of great sleep before you get back home. And so you can kind of start the week or start the work week or whatever, maybe or just get back to life easier, which makes a lot more sense in it. Because in the UK, I feel like that doesn't happen too often. People tend to kind of, you know, put the pedal to the metal and go straight to the edge of the cliff. You don't really have a downgrade. If anything, most of the time, especially when I used to rave a lot, people after the rave would be more inclined to look for other things to do to stay out so it's not like they're never down regulating they're always looking for the next thing who can get the baggie where should we go is that place open can we get beers there can we get drinks there they're continually looking for the next thing they're not really looking to kind of chill out so when i saw this post on the Berghain subreddit it made me laugh because this is completely foreign to what i do or to what anyone does here in the UK. But it also might explain why we're such Neanderthals here in the UK when it comes to clubbing and going out, and why we probably don't travel well, because we're not used to living in a place like Berlin where their clubs are open, you know, literally from Friday to Monday morning, and we're not used to, like, taking things slower, because I think, again, I don't think the Europeans are that much better than us when it comes to drinking, personally. I don't think they've got this special ordained ability or talent to kind of just you know do drugs and drink way more responsibly than us i think a major reason why they don't get as fucked up as us here in the uk is that they have more time to enjoy it if you have clubs most clubs most bars most open air venues right most regular schmegular places in berlin are at least open until 8 a.m in the morning if that's the case then it's really impossible to become a smackhead or a crackhead or to go too far because you've got so much time to kind of get into the mood of what you want to do you're not rushing to get to a bar like we do here in the uk to get a two-for-one cocktail deal you're not rushing to get to a bar because it might close at 1 a.m and it's 12 where you're at no because the club's open until 8 a.m so i think that plays a big role in their maturity and their approach to nightlife so it's no surprise when I see these threads or people asking what your after Berghain routine is. And people have some really interesting and good fucking ideas on what to do. Another one says here, pickle juice, electrolytes, vitamin mineral blast and some foe. And again, I can't imagine, or nowadays anyway, I do it. But back in the day, this would never have crossed my mind. Like to be thinking about what I'm going to do after the rave. Should I be drinking pickle juice? Should I be having some electrolytes, some vitamins, some some a good hearty meal with some vegetables and not trying to order a McDonald's? Nah. If anything, the first thing you're thinking of is a 24-hour McDonald's open. When does it open? Did I miss breakfast? Can I get another baggie? But it's not really about damn regulating and get yourself back to a, you know, semi-fighting shape. It's not really the case at all. Another person here says, it's always the same routine, coming home Monday morning, getting five to six hours of sleep, then going to the sauna or spa to relax and rehab. After that, I'm heading to my sister's house every Monday to dinner. That's quite a wholesome thing. And I like the idea of saunas too. I've noticed, especially if you have a night out and you're steaming, getting to a shower is fucking lovely. Um, actually, big up my guy Bobby Lee. Um, he's the one that actually taught me that actually because we would go to festivals or club nights and he'd be like, yeah, I'm going to jump in the shower. Like, what? It's literally got him at like 4 a.m 6 a.m and shit he said no trust me this is the one and i have to admit it is the one when you go out and you're around you know nonsense people you know swallowing their saliva swallowing with a spit and shit whatever it may be and then you suddenly then have the ability to jump in the shower and get all that nasty human muck off yourself Ooh, nothing hits better than that nothing hits better than that at all um and that says chimbling next to crisis i just put my normal people mask on and get up at five times a day and that says here i walk in the nature of my dogs i feel completely new i actually never get depressed after a party especially if my if i love the music i already think about the next one but the key word is balance clubbing is just one big side of my lifestyle i guess if i didn't have some healthy hobbies and friends the come down would be more depressing and miserable that's such a good point i never thought about that I never thought about the reason why a lot of people get, you know, the blues after a club night might have to do with the fact that their whole entire personality is wrapped around being a clubber, being a club kid. So when the club goes away, you're almost left thinking, who am I? 
that might be part of the reason that kind of explains it i'm not going to lie that kind of does explain it it kind of really does explain it but again as the person pointed out balance is the hardest thing but it is quite nice i found because i don't go as often as i did that out i find that now when i do go out i appreciate it and i want to make the most of it i'm not fucking around you know that's the thing that i've noticed about as well and also i'm not kind of you know wallowing in self-pity and shit so big up that poster another one says i sleep three hours heart attack wake up brunch at fruk stuk 3000 bathroom second heart attack champagne <laughs> plus taxi airport plane collapse sleep drive home sleep work gym fasting sleep dream of coming back asap Bergheim, repeat on thursday yeah i love that <laughs> another one says yeah this is more of an honest reply either last line bump bomb of k before leaving Bergheim uber home arrive home pour some music and dance drink my fruit smoothie i prepared before leaving the party that's incredibly responsible raving isn't it preparing a fucking fruit smoothie before you leave Woo! drink a minimum of one liter of water uh brinosaur tea don't know the english word drink two packs of electrolyte actually yeah what is that what is brinosaur tea man's never heard of bren Selly tea what the fuck is bren Selly? is that is that chamomile tea is that just German for chamomile? What's Brenselin tea? Brenzel tea. What is that? Uh, what are the benefits of... Oh, it's nettle tea. What is nettle tea? Nettle tea, according to Google. What is nettle tea? Hmm. What is you? What are you? Nettle tea, yeah? Nettle tea is an anti-inflammatory... Nettles are useful for a variety of inflammatory conditions such as arthritis, chronic ma malagia. Nettle tea or herbal supplements have both been effective to treat gout, relieve muscle aches, and minimize the symptoms of arthritis. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so they drink that. Don't know the English word. They drink two packs of electrolytes, eat some seeded fruit, nasal irrigation with Epsom salts. Yep, I love, love a bit of fucking... I love my neti potty, to be fair. Very important, especially for uh, meth, <laughs> meth I love this. is hilarious. Shower. Yes, use a sponge and wash up and scrub your legs as well. If I, Imagine someone have to tell you this, but, but that's definitely white people shit, isn't it? White people don't scrub their legs when they shower. It's fucking wild. Or their feet. Um, if I can sleep, I go to bed with an awesome sleep playlist. If I can't, I sit on my laptop and do more K and make more music. Imagine doing all of this health and wellness stuff, right? And then decide to do another bump before you sleep. Like, why would you do that to yourself? Just go to sleep. Imagine doing all of that stuff, all of that great shit. Drinking water, drink, having nettle tea, electrolytes, nasal irrigation, and then having one last bump. Like, come on, man. Thank you so much once again for tuning in to the one and only Agostino Zinger Show. It's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual. Thank you for hanging out with me.